So now, it is my incredible privilege to introduce our guests for this evening. First off, we have Dr. Michael Prenti, who has been a very vocal and persistent critic of US foreign policy and interventionism over the past 25 years. He received his PhD in political science from Yale, although he now likes to refer to himself as a recovering academic. He is the author of many books, including Super Patriotism, which is a, an exploration of the cultural dynamics that have uh, served as the underpinning to US foreign policy in recent years. The Assassination of Julius Caesar, nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in 2003, and his upcoming work, The Culture Struggle. Our other guest tonight is Christopher Hitchens. The <laughs> a former columnist for The Nation, Christopher Hitchens is by no means a stranger to controversy. He found himself in a number of very heated and public disputes with people he proclaimed himself to be former comrades and allies in the wake of September 11th after he came out in support of the Bush administration's plans for Iraq and Afghanistan. Aside from the nation, he is now contributing editor to Vanity Fair and writes regularly for the Times Literary Supplement and the online magazine Slate.com, amongst many others. His books include The Missionary Position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice, It always gets a laugh. The title always gets a laugh. The Trial of Henry Kissinger and his most recent work, Love, Poverty, and War, Journeys and Essays. So that's it for my role. It is my great privilege to introduce to all of you Dr. Michael Prenti and Christopher Hitchens. How about moderating? Does anybody have a seat? That's all right. Are you all right? Okay. Can everybody hear me? No. Can everybody hear me now? All right. Now it's on. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, uh, by agreement, uh, opening tonight will be uh, Christopher Hitchens. I recently realized after returning from a long trip to Iran that I've become the only person, I think, since the year 2000 to have reported from both, with both, from Iran, um, from Iraq, and from North Korea. In other words, to have, without particularly wishing to, have become an expert in axes of evil. And I'll just say, to begin with, that it's a huge pleasure to be invited to debate these grave matters in what seems to me to be the Hogwarts dining hall. <laughs> uh, some of you, some of you look from where I'm standing reassuringly antique. I can see some veteran visages uh, in the hall, but I also notice that quite a lot of you are, are terrifyingly young. And I wanted, uh, this is perhaps a pity, but I hope it won't be, because I, I want to date my remarks from the year um, 1989. In fact, uh, to be specific, from the fall of that year, which will be perhaps a legend or an early memory to some of you, but which is always worth looking up. Um, it was in, the, in that year that a uh, tremendous act of uh, social and national emancipation occurred not just in the countries of the former Soviet empire and its dependencies, who saw their former masters and their former system of banana republic socialism melting away, but an emancipation for all of us too, all of us like myself, I was born in 1949, who'd been brought up in the shadow not just of the Cold War, but of its corollary, uh, the arms race. 
the permanent threat of nuclear extinction, um, the zero sum and authoritarian manner in which all political arguments had to be conducted, whether it was Chile or South Africa or Vietnam or Poland or Czechoslovakia, everything one found, one attempted to make sense or to uh, deploy reason uh, was shoehorned into the uh, conscripting categories of the Cold War with over it all the time the possibility that a final solution would be found in the form of a thermonuclear <coughs> extinction. To be freed from this and from its counterpart, the concept of the one-party dictatorial state was an extraordinary moment of what I suppose I'd now have to call euphoria. It didn't seem so euphoric at the time, though there were beautiful moments to it. I was in Romania, for example, for the end of the Ceausescu dictatorship. Um, it seemed realistic. We began to hear some foolishness being uttered. Uh, Professor Fukuyama's um, prediction of the end of history, I think, I think now, as I thought then, was perhaps a little premature. But there were reasons to think that a synthesis might be possible, that some of what had been learned by the socialist movement in its long struggle through the 19th and 20th centuries uh, could be used to uh, tame uh, the concept of the free market society and the, um, and the open market society, uh, that there would be money to spare at last. There was talk, not idealistic talk only, of a peace dividend in those days. Some of you will remember it perhaps with a pang. What we were spending on weapons of mass destruction could perhaps be deployed to nobler ends, and it might even be possible to have another look at the terms of trade that governed relations between the rich and poor worlds. It was not a bad little time in which to be alive, in other words. I haven't done the exact maths, but you can do it in your head. How long did this period last? This period of feeling that there was only one future model, and that whatever form it took, it would have to take a democratic form, a pluralist form. That the age of the totalitarian despot was gone. I would say the Berlin Wall fell on, I think, November the 9th. 89. Ceausescu was dead by Christmas Eve of the same year. If we date it, say, from New Year's 1990, I think it gives us about six and a half months of this illusion. Because in six and a half months, Slobodan Milosevic had invaded Bosnia, and Saddam Hussein had not just invaded Kuwait, people say invade, hadn't occupied Kuwait even. He had annexed Kuwait, made part of Iraq, what had up till then been a member state of the United Nations, a uh, member in good standing of the Arab League and an independent country, and had said that it no longer existed, an unprecedented form of promiscuous aggression. Uh, and we found, no, we haven't got rid of the one party uh, leader, the man who believes that he is God. We haven't got rid of the Balkans of this, and we haven't got rid of it in the Middle East, and it's still restless and sleepless, and it means us harm. And within a year or so of that, a similarly ideological party uh, had seized control in Rwanda and decided to embark on a final solution of its own. And the one had previously thought unsurpassable cult of the personality and of the one god, one leader, one party state had metamorphosed in Korea, North Korea, from father to son. And all along, and unnoticed by many people, another ideology, a totalitarian ideology, based on race and nation and religion and absolutism, was gathering strength unofficially in many other countries. I mean to say by this, the ideology of jihad, the ideology of holy war, where the one ideology is replaced by the one religion, where the one infallible leader is replaced by the one god, and where only one book is required and where all of human culture that doesn't conform to this book is to be treated as something to be dynamited or destroyed or profaned. These people wish us ill. Now, what was the response of Western democracies to this? In Rwanda, it was for Madeleine Albright. I'll take them in no particular order. Madeleine Albright, on Mr. Clinton's instructions, vetoed the resolution from the Czech Republic that asked for a mere doubling of the tiny United Nations force in Kigali that might if it had been beefed up, have at least warned the Rwandan government that its plans were known. 
It was decided at the United Nations by Kofi Annan in person, the man who received the faxes and warnings from Kigali to let Rwanda go. It wasn't worth fighting for. Um, it took uh, five years before it was discovered that the rule of Slobodan Milosevic in Bosnia and the mad idea, um, excuse me, in Serbia, and the mad idea that he could make national and international borders conform to ethnic patterns and cleanse those who didn't fit was not compatible with peace in Europe. <clears throat> and after the eviction of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, it took a further 10, perhaps to 12 years to, for us to make the elementary discovery that we have to keep on making it seems every generation. Our life, however much we may uh, reserve our own right to criticize it, our way of life, as it's sometimes called, um, the things that we value in our own society and in our own culture is not compatible with the existence of totalitarian, aggressive, expansionist dictatorship. I myself am happy with the conclusion that our life and culture are not compatible with this because I don't think it's desirable that we should collude and collaborate or coexist with aggressive totalitarian dictatorship. And since our special subject this evening is Iraq, I hope I've put it in some context to you. I must explain as honestly as I can why it is that I came to the conclusion that a settlement of accounts with Saddam Hussein must be made and that the Iraqi people must be helped to move into the post-Saddam Hussein era. Um, as I've just said, I'm not a fetishist of the rules of the United Nations or of its procedures, the ones that abandoned uh, Rwanda and Bosnia, for example, and that allowed a Russian veto or a Chinese veto on any attempt to do anything about these things as well. Um, I remind you that in uh, May of the year 2003, Iraq was going to become the chairman of the United Nations Special Committee on Disarmament. In other words, the Committee on Disarmament would have been headed by someone appointed by Saddam Hussein. At the same period, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, I think, had the chairmanship of Colonel Gaddafi. The United Nations had uh, failed us very badly in all these crises, and I want you to keep that in mind as we go along. But let us, let us apply the criteria that the United Nations itself applies for discovering when a state has put itself outside the pale, when it has lost its sovereignty, when the international community may be called upon to intervene. <clears throat> there are four conditions under which it may be said that a state has lost its sovereignty, sacrificed it. One, uh, repeated aggressions against neighboring states, or occupations of or annexations of same. Second, violations of the Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention, for those who sign it, we are among the signatories, uh, mandates action without further recourse to any further resolution in the case of genocide, either to prevent or to punish it. That's mandatory. Third, um, collusion by the relevant state with uh, international gangsterism, harboring, in other words, of terrorism. Uh, ninth. And fourth, uh, violations of the Non-Proliferation Treaty or other uh, shall we say, um, uh, promiscuous behavior in respect to weapons of mass destruction. Iraq meets all four of those conditions in a serial manner. It had invaded Iran. It had tried to destroy uh, and abolish, and obliterate the state of Kuwait. It still retained the ambition to repeat both aggressions. Uh, it had violated the Genocide Convention by uh, very well and uh, exhaustively documented uh, state campaign of murder uh, known as the Anfal Campaign, which we have now all the incriminating documents in our possession to try and uh, not just disperse, but to destroy uh, the Kurdish population of northern Iraq, using for the purpose, as it had with the intervention in Iran, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, principally uh, of chemical uh, description and type. Uh, it had sheltered uh, Mr. Yassin, uh, the man wanted, most wanted for the blowing up of the World Trade Center in New York in 1993. It had sheltered Mr. Abu Nidal, who before the advent of Mr. Osama bin Laden was the most wanted international gangster in the world, specializing in the uh, assassination of democratic uh, members of the Palestine Liberation Organization. 
uh, it had in the name of its own president, Saddam Hussein, openly paid uh, a bounty for every suicide bomber operating in the Israeli-Palestine dispute. And its agents and envoys have been repeatedly meeting with agents and envoys of Al-Qaeda in various locations in what I would describe as a kind of Hitler-Stalin pact between two discrepant forms of jihadist regime. It had adopted itself the ideology of jihad, dropping its old Ba'athist fascism. And finally, it refused stubbornly and repeatedly to come into compliance with any United Nations resolution governing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it never came into compliance until the last day of its existence. It had a special department of state for the concealment of weapons of mass destruction and had never given an account of the weapons that it had declared to the UN inspectors some years before. The option of uh, further coexistence with such a regime simply did not exist. And all of this would have been the case uh, long before uh, we became aware, in the abrupt way in which we became made aware of it, of the, the really genuine threat of an Islamic fascism that, among other things, the, the beggaring and destruction of Afghanistan, the reduction of Afghanistan to a serf state with women as chattel and Shia Muslims as uh, targets in a free fire zone, uh, bankruptcy, misery, starvation, uh, slavery. Um, not only had such achievements as that to its credit, but had managed in a small way to build a secret army within the borders of the United States. Um, I mentioned that crux point because I can't not mention it, <clears throat> but I want to draw your attention to two things. Before the year 2001, it had been decided by a vote in the Senate of the Iraq Liberation Act in the year uh, 1998 on the initiative of the Clinton-Gore administration um, that the policy of the United States government should be the removal of the government of Saddam Hussein. That was a, a vote in which there was no contrary vote in the Senate, a unanimous vote to adopt the Iraq Liberation Act as American policy. The, the two best speeches given, in fact, about the, the, the certainty of an ultimate confrontation with Saddam Hussein on the matter of weapons and terrorism, if nothing else, uh, were, were both made by President Clinton at that period. And a very significant speech made by um, Prime Minister Tony Blair in Chicago in 1999, after the departure of Slobodan Milosevic to The Hague, where he quite properly stands trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity, saying that this uh, did not mean the struggle was over because down the road there was undoubtedly going to be a meeting with Saddam Hussein and his, and his, his party and the crime family with which he ran Iraq as the psychopathic state that it was, the, the, the private property of a, of a sadistic uh, minority. You have two minutes. Very well. I, I don't think I'm going to need two. Uh, if I haven't persuaded you by now that this was something that had to happen, <clears throat> was going to happen, probably ought to have happened um, in 1991 when the opportunity presented itself after the Kuwait war. I may not be able to do so in the remaining 90 seconds. What I want to dispel, though, is what I believe to be a very widespread impression that there was something improvised or faked or contrived <laughs> or confected about this confrontation. I hope I've said enough to persuade you, or at least to invite you to consider persuading yourselves that what you're so glibly told about Iraq becoming a sudden target of opportunity for the Halliburton Company, or something uh, to enhance the Bush administration's credibility after the reverses in 2001 is not really true. And that those, or in fact, isn't true at all. And that those of us who some years ago decided to range ourselves on the side of the heroic forces of opposition among Iraqi Arabs and Kurds, those who dared to think that it would be possible to take down and remove the disgusting, unlawful uh, regime of Saddam Hussein, uh, can be proud of what we've done, as I am. Because not only can Iraq now be certified as disarmed, which it now at last can, if you wanted to certify it as disarmed before, you'd have had to take Saddam Hussein's word for it, which I would strongly recommend you don't do. Not only are those who perpetrated the genocide at long last being ranged in the dock and brought to justice and made to face their victims, uh, not only are the neighboring countries to Iraq able to breathe more freely because they know that a sleepless aggressor and conspirer across their borders is no longer there, uh, but better than all that, and better than all the conformity with international resolutions that I mentioned before, 
Time. I've had the opportunity to see something that I hope you one day get the chance to see too, which is what a people looks like when it's been liberated. There is no experience like that, no experience like the look on the face of people who suddenly find themselves free, who had up till then been the property of the state uh, and the victims of torture and tyranny. And to be able to do this and all those other things too Thank you. is something that I um, envy those who uh, didn't do it. Thank you, Mr. Right. Hitchens. Thank you. Dr. Prenzi, please. I agree with uh, Christopher Hitchens that it's not just a, a, um, an incidental thing, the Iraqi policy of the US, but I do think that there is contrivance. I do think there is confection. I do think there, that it's a policy that has been based on lies, as so much of US policy has been predicated on lies. Not just misunderstandings, not just faulty intelligence, not just honest mistakes, but real lies, really going against the evidence when they knew the evidence was contrary to what they wanted to say. And those who find it necessary to lie to us are not worthy of our support because they are advancing their own interests and not ours. And I think Iraq is a recent case. George Bush, October 2002. Quote, Iraq is reconstituting its nuclear weapons program. That was a lie. He had ample evidence from UN inspectors and everyone else that that just wasn't true. Bush, January 03. Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. That was a lie, and he knew it was a lie when he said it. There was no such uh, uranium being sought by Saddam Hussein from Africa. Bush again, Iraq has trained Al-Qaeda in poisonous and deadly gases that could allow the Iraq regime to attack America. Another lie, if anything, the CIA gave a contrary report that Iraq had no, no uh, uh, sub, any kind of substantial connections to Al-Qaeda. Um, we mustn't forget that genius of strategic planning that giant among policymakers, Donald Rumsfeld. And he says, we know where Iraq's weapons of mass destruction are. They're in an area around Tikrit and Baghdad and east, west, south, and north, somewhat, somewhat. <laughs> Again, no such weapons were found, not in the east, west, south, or north, and not even in the somewhat. Colin Powell, in his shameful dog and pony act before the UN Security Council, February 03. Iraq has a stockpile of between 100 and 500 tons of chemical weapon agents. Not one drop of that massive stockpile was ever found. And what evidence did Powell offer? He put up slides, pictures of trucks parked in front of buildings. And he said, we think we, these trucks have it. It's in these trucks. We all sit there and go, ooh, ooh, there's something in those trucks. And then the next slide came up and said, notice six hours later, the same building, the trucks are gone. Ooh, the trucks are gone. The trucks had wheels. Ooh, they went somewhere. Oh. The White House claimed that the U.S. is bringing democracy to Iraq, like the claim it's bringing democracy everywhere else. It's a supremacist view upon which US policy is predicated. Patronizing of other people, that we must teach these less adept people the blessings of American democracy, that we'll bring them, we'll uplift them from their, in the case of Iraq, from their 5,000 years of civilization, and we will uh, show them how to do things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, Iraqis brought democracy to themselves in 1958. They had a revolution, a broad-based democratic revolution. They threw out the US and British oil companies. They began a program of social reform, of not-for-profit public ownership. And it was Saddam Hussein, funded and backed by the CIA, who destroyed that revolution, torturing and murdering every progressive, Democrat, communist, constitutionalist, 
socialist, every reformer, killed them, tortured them, or drove them into exile, or drove them underground, with the CIA giving him names and lists. He even destroyed the left wing of his own Baptist party. And during those years when he was doing that, that's what I hate about these things, you can't regulate your distance from the amplifier if you really want to get going. It's, you can step back and shout, but this comes with you. During those years, during those years when he was doing most of his torturing and most of his murder, he was Washington's poster boy. And at this point we hear, well, isn't it good that we finally moved against him? Yeah, but there's something hypocritical about supporting a tyrant for over 20 years and even sigging him on Iran. Hitch mentioned the Iraq-Iran aggression. Uh, I mean, that was supported by the US. Then suddenly declaring him to be a mortal threat to the US and to the world, never mentioning all the past support you gave to this murderer. Now, now suddenly he's a tyrant and a danger to us when he gets out of line on oil prices and oil quotas, as in 1990, when he starts committing economic nationalism and keeps the whole economy, including the oil industry, nationalized, when he refuses to be a compliant comprador leader who would turn his country into a client state for US global investors, where he refused, when he refused to have, when it proved that he wasn't going to let Iraq be a cow that would be milked by US global investment interests. When he refused to do that, when he started training cadres of Iraqi engineers, when he started developing Iraq in a self-defining his own way, that's when he became a tyrant. And let's look at the White House claim about bringing democracy, or what the media calls US-sponsored elections. The White House never wanted those elections. Brent Scowcroft, who served Bush Sr., let the cat out of the bag in May 2003. Scowcroft said, no, we don't want elections. What if they elect someone we don't like and can't work with? You know, it's wonderful when they speak with such honesty. Every so often, a, a bit of candor comes out. It was the Shia majority. It was Sistani. It was these massive demonstrations they had last year, early last year, that kept demanding these elections. And it was the pressure on Bush and Rumsfeld, even from people within his own party, pressure with like, asking questions like, what's your exit strategy? strategy? What the hell exactly are we doing there? What are you going to come up with something? And that's what they came up with. They, reluctant, they reluctantly settled on elections to show that they could come up with something. But to now claim that this was our noble mission all along is, again, profoundly misleading. You know, in the old days, they used to give you a glass, a little dignity you could sip from the glass. Now you've got to stand here and swig from the bottle right in front of everyone. Hey, so how am I doing, eh? Salute. <laughs> We also hear the US is fighting Islamic terrorism or Islamic fascists, as Christopher Hitchin calls them, which isn't such a bad term, but that some people would have problems with that. But ladies and gentlemen, a full year before September 11, a full year before the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the Project for a New American Century, a right-wing think tank which was populated by the present players of the Bush administration, published a plan making it clear that the White House intended to take direct military control of the Gulf region, whether or not Saddam Hussein was still in power. So Saddam was not the issue. Nor was terrorism the issue, since this plan was put forth before 9-11, well before the much-hyped but little-done war on terrorism declared. You know it's much-hyped. I call it little-done because almost nothing's been done regarding terrorism. No networks of terrorists have been unearthed by the Bush people. There hasn't been, there's been only one court case of a terrorist in the US brought to trial. No defense of our water supply. 
No defense of our nuclear plants yet that's been put up worthy of the name. Bush's own Secretary of Agriculture in December, the last December, in a moment of honesty, quote, it's a miracle that the terrorists haven't attacked our food supply, which remains totally vulnerable. He's no longer Secretary of Agriculture. <laughs> Islamic fascists, well, yes, indeed they exist. We have Christian fascists right in this country who are calling for jihad. Listen to Randall Terry. Listen to Randall Terry of, of, of Operation uh, Rescue. Just the other day, he said, when we come to power, and we will, and this becomes a Christian nation, you will be tried and executed. He was talking to doctors and medical personnel who were involved in abortions. You will be executed for murder. Randall Terry, who said, let a wave of intolerance wash over you, he told the Christian audience. We do not want pluralism. We do not want equal time. We want a Christian theocratic nation. I mean, he said it. D. John Kennedy of the Dominions, the same thing. We will have a Christian culture. The, uh, the media will be Christian. Our schools, our education, our history books, everything will be Christian. There will be one way. Our medical practices, our science will all be Christian-based. They have a totalitarian theocracy there. Well, should we then go and bomb Kansas and Mississippi and Arkansas to root them out? <laughs> that's, going, that's going to be my question to you, head chef. <laughs> you know, they, and they're not just bluffing, man. They already have a very healthy control of the majority party, a good chunk of the majority party right now. They have the majority leader of the Senate serving up to them, and the President of the United States doing prayer and Bible sessions with them. Now, as far as Islamic fascists, indeed, there are some nasty, vicious, murderous people in the ranks of this Islamic Mujahideen movement. Worse than that, it, uh, much of that movement has been organized like a political party with cadres for political action and conversion and community service work, along with armed units and suicide attackers and the like. But I would have to say that, in, that as of two years ago, that was much truer of Hezbollah in Lebanon, for instance, than anything in Iraq as of two years ago. If US rulers are really out to get these terrorists, why did they attack Iraq, which was a secular state? Why are they using a sledgehammer to kill mosquitoes and swinging the sledgehammer in wrong places? The Islamic fundamentalist influence was weakly situated in Iraq until the US invasion and occupation created a self-fulfilling Frankenstein monster. The Muja Thank you. The Mujahideen momentum and strength in Iraq has developed since the occupation. And why not? Why? That's, not, that's to be understood. First, you go into Iraq and you wipe out the democratic revolution. You wipe out all the reformers. You wipe out all the constitutionalists. You wipe out all the socialists, using Saddam Hussein to do the dirty work. Then you invade and you wipe out the military, conservative, secularist, nationalist forces, including Saddam himself. So what's left? Where else to go for those who see their country and region going down the tubes? To Islam, to the fundamentalists who are ready to put their lives on line against the infidel invaders. And even so, by the way, even having said that, the Islamic reactionaries do not represent the entire resistance movement, not by a long shot. There are nationalists, there are secularist reformist groups that are involved, there are, there are ex-Bathists, you know, you, you demobilize 450,000 Baptist, and, and I know that's a big, a big number, but if you count paramilitaries, security forces, police and such, it would come to something like that. Even if just 5,000 of them go into underground action, that makes for a very troublesome insurgent force. So, <clears throat> I want to launch into another whole thing, but I have now, what, 10 30 seconds. seconds? 30 seconds. So I, uh, US policy is, uh, then the question does come up, what is US policy based on? 
I am one of those who do, do not believe that U.S. policy is stupid or foolish or misplaced or confused. The fact that they're trying to confuse you doesn't mean that they themselves are confused. They know what they're doing, and they do have an agenda and, a, and, a, and certain ends uh, that are very real and very obvious, uh, and I'll speak to them when I can grab my other 10 minutes in a while. Okay. Uh, We have a microphone again. All right. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, you now have 10 minutes to reply. Once again, feel myself drowning in uh, time. Um, look, just on this question of the weaponry, and you ought, to, you ought to criticize yourselves for laughing so easily at such uh, uh, cheap points. Here's the fact. Here is the fact. Here is a regime that has used them repeatedly on its own soil and the soil of neighbors, that has a special department of state for concealment that nearly defeated the heroic United Nations inspector, great Swedish socialist Rolf Ikeas, the founder of the first UNSCOM, uh, in his attempts to discover what the truth of the situation was and always constituted at least a latent if not a blatant threat, and was always a permanent threat, if not an imminent one. What have we found since the invasion? I'll tell you what we've found since the invasion. Dr. Mahdi Obeidi, Saddam's chief nuclear scientist, whose book, The Bomb in My Garden, I thoroughly recommend to you, among other things, for its portrayal of the life of a, a scientist under the Ba'ath Party regime, buried in his garden, and we, we know he's not making this up because he's produced it, along with several yards of instruction manual, the elements of, in fact, the whole constituent of a nuclear centrifuge, the most important element in the creation of a nuclear weapon. He buried it under the orders of Kusai Hussein, uh, one of Saddam's two charming possible successors, if we'd let it run, uh, who was in charge of the concealment program. We have that centrifuge now. The United Nations inspectors would never have found it, even if they'd been looking. We also find uh, the, the, abs the, the CD account that the whole minutes of a meeting is as late as March 2003, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, in Damascus between Saddam Hussein's envoys and those of Kim Jong-il to buy from North Korea off the shelf the long-range missiles that Iraq was prohibited from making by the sanctions. Um, I'm afraid to say Dr. Parenti is quite wrong, but both inquiries uh, in Washington and in London have found that there were indeed ongoing attempts by Saddam Hussein's agents to buy uranium in West Africa, uh, perhaps for recreational purposes, but there comes a point where one uh, thinks that this regime is not entitled to the presumption of innocence. And here's where you have to be responsible. You have to imagine what you might have to do yourself if you were in power and you knew that there was such a regime, would you say, well, let's give them another chance? Would you say they're entitled to the benefit of any doubt? Remember, at all times, there is sniping, quite correctly, from those who say that the warning signs from Afghanistan, a militarily negligible country, were being ignored by the administration. Would anyone have decided to take Saddam Hussein's word for it in this context? Uh, uh, the, the Dwelfa report, uh, the recent UN report on the uh, evacuation of um, nuclear and yellow cake sites in Iraq show that Iraq was, at the time of its invasion, a functioning WMD state with all the latent potential and all the concealment, all the expertise, and all the technique that was needed to revive that program once the sanctions had ceased to operate, which they were ceasing to do. These are plain facts. They're available to anybody, and they're not to be sneered at or about. Otherwise, why would Hans Blix have said before the war that he didn't know how much would be found, but he knew there would, there would have to be something. Why would Gerhard Schroeder's intelligence have said that Saddam Hussein was anything from five to 10 years away? They kept changing the figure from a functioning thermonuclear weapon. Why would Mr. Chirac, who after all had built Saddam Hussein a nuclear reactor, knowing what he wanted it for, while retaining his veto at the United Nations, have said the same? Why did I have to debate in the five months before the war began, every night with members of the anti-war movement who said, you can't invade Iraq. Their weapons of mass destruction will kill thousands and thousands of our soldiers. You can look that up too if there's anyone here from MoveOn 
Org or any other such heroic organization. That's what you guys were saying then. So this is not a confection. It's a Hitlerian pounding has its own reward, I see on the platform. Um, this is not a confection. It's a, it's a reasoned judgment about the existence of uh, an, an intolerable threat, and it was very soundly evidentially based. Um, Michael Parenti, to my somewhat to my shock, says we should rather rely on what the CIA's evaluation of this was. Now, I quite, I must say, I entirely fail to see why the CIA's almost invariably fallacious reports on this and other threats should be taken seriously by anybody, let alone somebody claiming to be a socialist. The CIA said Saddam Hussein wasn't going to invade Kuwait because it wouldn't be in his interest. They said he wasn't flirting with Al-Qaeda when he was. They said he wasn't doing weapons of mass destruction when he was, and as you say, they'd helped him to get to power in the first place. They had implied that the Iranians and not the Iraqis had uh, conducted the chemical weapons massacre at Halabja and have in general done nothing right or got nothing right in this whole argument. Why quote them against the Bush administration when they are in fact the saboteurs of the regime change policy? Worse than that, you quote Brent Scowcroft, a man who, with his former boss, President Bush Sr., with Lawrence Eagleburger, with Pat Buchanan, with most of the members of Kissinger Associates, in fact, has always been completely opposed to the regime change policy. I'm not surprised Scowcroft doesn't want an election. I'm not surprised Bremer wasn't that keen on one. But we did have an election, and I'm not going to, I hope, have to underline to anybody in this room how important it was to see what the Iraqi people are capable of when they're emancipated from uh, the rule of a, of a psychopathic uh, totalitarian. These are points that are made not even ironically, it seems to me, by Dr. Parenti there. They don't really rise to the level of sarcasm any more than does his false trail about the Christian right. Now, you might search, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to do it high and low among people like uh, myself and Michael who make our living writing and speaking and thinking about this kind of thing. You're not going to find anyone, I don't think, who's made the record as often as I have in opposition to Christian fundamentalism in this country and everywhere else. And in fact, to all forms of religious nonsense and their, and their application to the, the, the pretense that they apply uh, to human and civil society. I've set my, uh, my life on this, on this point, the, the struggle for a secular state and the uh, struggle actually for an atheist worldview. It's not the same thing. You can be secular and be religious, um, but it's, it matters to me very much. Now, what's wrong with the picture painted by Dr. Parenti, uh, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, two guys whose political weight, I think, has for 25 years now been grossly overestimated, who never quite do produce the voters and the uh, punch that they claim to have. But let's remember, these are the two men who said that the World Trade Center was the deserved punishment that America had earned for itself, for its so many iniquities. It was they who parroted the line of Pro Professor Chomsky that the United States had this coming. These men prefer any theocracy to any kind of democracy. Of course, they are our common enemy. But if I want to go and make war and don't kid about it, I'm perfectly willing to use force with these guys if they even threaten it with us. More than willing. Would rather welcome the chance, actually, to do it. I'm going to have a thin time doing it if my allies on the left are making excuses for Islamic Jihad all the while and discrediting their own democracy and isolating themselves within civil society. It, the fact of the matter is that you either oppose religious dictatorship and its terrorist surrogates everywhere without distinction, whether it's messianic settlers on the West Bank or Christian nutbags trying to teach us that uh, we trod the earth the same time as the dinosaurs or the forces of jihad. You either oppose this kind of thing root and branch or you don't. And I'm sorry to say that the anti-war left has failed the test. It has made excuses for our totalitarian and theocratic enemies. It has said that Mr. bin Laden is the ventriloquist of long forgotten Muslim grievances. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I'll tell you what the grievances are. The grievance of seeing an undraped female face. The grievance of having a Christian or a Jew or a non-believer living on your soil that you claim is Muslim soil. The horror of having lost the Islamic Caliphate. The empire you want back. These are not anti-imperialists. They're people who want back a lost empire. The people who blew up uh, harmless party goers in Bali because Australia had helped to liberate East Timor from Indonesian 
oppression, and East Timor is a Christian population and, and Indonesia is Muslim. High on the list of bin Laden's grievances, the outrage of our help for East Timor. Yes, they have grievances, yeah, but it's nothing to the grievance we have with them. And it should be we who they are afraid of. It should be our opinion that they are made to care about. We should make it known to them that we too have unalterable values, that yes, we do care about the Enlightenment, and we do care about the defense of our values and institutions under any government. Two minutes. Under any government, and that failing to say this is apologetics and possibly worse. And nothing, nothing in what Michael said, it seems to me, would prepare you in any sense for the importance of a struggle of that kind. Um, close on another point of fact. Uh, there are two ways of telling someone really neither knows nothing or cares nothing about Iraq. One is if they start by saying, yeah, I know Saddam was a bad guy, but you know right away. They have no idea what the regime was like. The second is if they say that was a secular state. In what respect, I ask you, is a man who, after the Gulf War, the war with Iran, that's to say, put uh, Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag where it had never been before, built the largest mosque in the Middle East in his own name, announced that Iraq was a jihadist state, paid for the suicide bombers in Palestine, in other words, for Islamic Jihad, to undermine the PLO, uh, who praised the World Trade Center bombings, who invited Abu Musad al-Zakawi, bin Laden's lieutenant, into Iraq before the intervention, when Pakistan and Saudi Arabia were expelling such people from their countries, Saddam Hussein was inviting the jihadists in. To say this was a secular regime is to show that one doesn't know, and I'm very sorry to say it shows, that one doesn't care. It isn't serious to argue in this way. And it's time that those of us who want to defend our civilization do not say, well, we will defend it. If only Bush wasn't president, we might even think about doing a, a bit of work to stick up for the values of culture as against the values of barbarism. This is frivolous, frivolous, and deserves to be voted down very heavily at a place of higher learning like this one. Thank you. I wish I had an hour to, uh, to, to respond to every one of the points uh, that Mr. Hitchens uh, brings up, but let me, let me respond to one of them. That little phrase put in there about Saddam isn't the secular state. Look at all these things he's done. He, he did slip in a phrase that, that I hope you didn't miss. He said, after the Gulf War, and that's exactly true, uh, Hitch, that's exactly true. That's when it was. After the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein did start mending fences with the religionists. He needed the support, all the support he could get. Cool. I, want, I, want to get I, want to, um, I want to get to the real reasons why the U.S. ruling class pursues the invasion and occupation of Iraq, because they're roughly the same considerations that dictate U.S. interventions in many other places. First and foremost, the goal of U.S. policy is to establish a lock on the material resources and markets of the world over the regimes that might dare to chart an independent course, those that might try to move outside the neoliberal free market global system. Any country that tries to use its land, labor, capital, markets, and natural resources in a self-defining and self-developing way, and Iraq was one of those countries for whatever else we could say about Saddam Hussein, that country will be targeted and its leaders will be demonized, bombed, or ousted in soft coups or whatever. The goal is the privatization and deregulation of everything, of the entire world economy and the elimination of public sector services, the elevating of the property interest and right above every other right. Well, you really think U.S. rulers go in and do all these places because they want to abolish uh, public services in these countries and they want to uh, cut back their, uh, their public sector and do these things? Well, they're doing that here in this country. Of course they're doing it there. Iraq had an economy that was completely publicly owned. Donald Rumsfeld made a remark that I found interesting and even bitterly amusing in its choice of words. He said, it's a Stalinized economy. The entire economy is state-owned. Well, not anymore. The coalition authority set up a special commission whose job it is to privatize everything. Billions of dollars in public capital are being privatized. Hotels, utilities, airlines, air routes, 
factories, the few that are standing. Billions more are being expropriated from another source. I'm looking at that source right now, from you, from U.S. taxpayers in contracts, in contracts to Bechtel, Halliburton, and 70 other companies. That, may not be, that might not be the motor reason for U.S. foreign policy, but it's a factor. Could we not mention it instead of dismissing it? That $80 billion has gone to these companies, that the word on the street is this, is, Iraq is the hottest place for investments, biggest profits we can get. We could at least mention that, can't we? The empire feeds off the republic. It's called creative destruction. You destroy a self-producing economy, take it over, and reinvest to rebuild with fat government contracts. In fact, you don't even have to bother to rebuild in some cases. As the Pentagon itself said, tens of billions of dollars, maybe one third of the money that was supposed to be allocated, remains unsupervised and unaccounted for. We don't even know where it is gone. Your tax dollars at work. Another reason for war with Iraq is that it was a bad example to other countries in the region that might want to chart an independent course. It could emerge as a regional power. It had the highest standard of living in the Middle East. The US goal was to prevent the emergence of any strong regional power. Look at the way conservatives have wanted to target China. They were targeting China, in fact, right up through 2002, until the Iraqi thing came over, then that, then that, that, then that got put on the back shelf. The strategic goal is anti-development and greater dependency. There's no need to develop a, a middle class in this country or that country and the other country in the hope that they might not go communist or anything. There's, no, there's nobody, we're not competing against any Soviet any, any longer. The goal is the forced third worldization of everywhere, including not just Asia and the Middle East and Africa, but also North America and Europe itself. Another reason, I think, is the straight old colonial goal, colonial grab of resources. Iraq has high quality crude, 131 billion barrels of some of the top crude. Um, and at today's prices, that's worth between four and five trillion dollars. This represents the biggest oil grab in human history. So all these somewhat different but interrelated motives are at work. And the presence of one does not dilute or, or cancel out the other. Well, well how, do you, how, do, how do you know that these US rulers have this hidden agenda? Why should we think there's some kind of secret conspiracy theory? Immediately bring up the word conspiracy. Whenever you talk about rulers as working with intent and motive, people say you're ascribing conspiracy. You can say farmers are organizing and pursuing their interests. School teachers are doing it. But the minute you suggest that the people who own the world are doing it, you say, oh, do you have a conspiracy theory? I mean, you think there's a, a group of men, uh, people sitting around in a room planning this? You know, that's the, that, that image is supposed to be so utterly devastating. I say, oh, no, they're, they're not sitting around in a room. They're, they, they meet on carousels, you know, or they, or they uh, or they are on park benches, or they go skydiving together and hold hands, and they, and they talk about the Uruguay protocols and, and, the, and, and opening up new military bases in Central Asia and all that. No, of course they meet in rooms. Where the hell else do you think they meet? <laughs> so this, uh, let me tell you about this secret conspiracy theory. First of all, it's no theory. It's actually happening. They are invading. They are building all these military bases all over the globe. They are privatizing every place. They are handing out fat contracts. One, it's not a theory, the secret conspiracy theory. Two, it's not a secret. How do I know about it? They themselves say it. They got it on the goddamn internet. Go, go look up Project for a New American Century and read their Rebuilding American Defenses. They say it. They say all of this, that the U.S. has an unprecedented opportunity now to take hold of all the world's resources and determine policy everywhere. Two minutes, Dr. Prenti. Well, who is the Project for a New American Century? I'll tell you some of its members. Donald Rumsfeld. John Bolton, Paul Wolfowitz, Elliot Cohn, and Dick Cheney. George Bush and company are not just fighting Islamic theocrats, they're fighting the whole world. There are millions of moderate Muslims, democratic Muslims, who end up supporting jihad when they feel that fellow Islamics are under attack and being oppressed. You can look at Palmer, uh, Monty and Princess Palmer's book, 
uh, it's called one of those books, The Terror of God and All, where they talk about this and, this, and, and, and do a systematic study. And not just Muslims are opposed. In February and March 2003, we saw tens of millions of people in some 80 countries demonstrating all over. Finland, Lithuania, Spain, Italy, Great Britain, Japan, Indonesia, uh, Mexico, Nigeria, all over people demonstrating. I mean, now you talk about countries like Japan, Mexico, Finland, <clears throat> Finland, Lithuania, Canada. These are not countries that have a, a, exactly a very close cultural or historical link to Iraq. They don't have any, much of any at all to speak of. So they're demonstrating for two reasons. One, out of concern for the slaughter of human beings in Iraq, the destruction of whole cities as we see happening in Fallujah. Actually, we don't see it happening. It, does, it doesn't show it on US television. You can see it in some countries, but you can't see it here. So first, they out of concern for them. But they also demonstrated in great numbers out of concern for their own democratic sovereignty, sending a message to the US rulers, who would be rulers of the planet, Time. and saying to them, you do not rule the planet. You don't decide who lives and who dies. We have a right to be self-defining. Thank you. Thank you. OK, since I'm going to start off, I'm just going to ask a very simple question. And I'll leave all the incendiary questions to my colleagues here. So uh, it seems to me that it's really very hard for all of us to sort out who's right and who's wrong in a discussion of the causes or reasons or justifications of US policy in Iraq. And of course, there's nothing we can do about it now anyway, because the US is there. So the question I have is about the consequences or outcomes of US policy in Iraq. If we put ourselves in the year, say, 2010, five years from now, What's the situation going to look like in Iraq and in the region in the Middle East? What would your prediction be as to what the consequences of American policy are going to be? Now, I think most of us hope to still be around five years from now, and we'll then be able to tell who was right and who was wrong. So that's my question. That's to both, both panelists. You want me to go first, Rich, so you could have a second? You're welcome. I mean, it's up to you. Give I'm, something. I'm ready if that's what you Go want. ahead, go. Um, <laughs> rather than having thought that I was treading water for this question. Um, well, I'll tell you what I think and what I hope. Um, 2010, you said. Well, by then, the alliance between Ba'athism and Al Qaeda, the alliance no one believed in before, that's now staring us in the face every day, and is still denied, unbelievably. The functioning working alliance between Zarqawi and Saddamists will have been militarily defeated. Uh, I hope with extreme humiliation and ruthlessness. And that will send a message to a great number of people that that kind of force will, cannot hope to win. They, they, they will never take over another country ever again. We will not ever again be finding that we are stuck with a Taliban or Ba'ath type regime. Uh, no government supports these people can hope to survive. Uh, no movement that tries to become a government, no, no movement that tries to become such a government uh, can hope for anything but a hideous defeat. And we will have acquired, out uh, of what was a very large, professional, but rather soft army for a long time, there will be many, many, many thousands of American officers and soldiers uh, who will have acquired the combat experience that's necessary to do this. And don't tell me this combat experience won't be needed again. There's an Al-Qaeda attempt now being made to chaos and collapse Nigeria, a country we should be paying much more attention to than we do. We will certainly need to be helping the people of Iran to free themselves from a paralytic, uh, disgusting uh, theocracy. The, the skills of warfare that we're acquiring in this conflict will be tremendously useful to us. I hope also that by then there will have been a great deal more than we've so far seen of um, a democratic revolution in the region. A year or so ago, wherever I went, people would sneer at me and say, so you want Jeffersonian democracy in Iraq? As if they thought of it all by themselves. Pissed me off, I don't mind saying. <laughs> I've just finished a book about Thomas Jefferson. I said, well, no, actually, none of my Iraqi or Kurdish friends own any slaves. So it won't be a Jeffersonian democracy, no, but have you just noticed that America has never had a black or female president? 
Uh, but the Iraqis, the first time they have a chance to elect their own assembly and have a real democracy, 1958, don't believe a word you hear about that. Um, they pick the leader of the most despised and oppressed minority in the region to be their first president, Jalal Talabani, the leader of a people who until recently were being hunted and uh, treated like vermin in northern Iraq. I would say that wasn't bad. I would even think it might deserve a round of applause. Now, I'll make this into a thank you. Tepid, but not bad. No. Program. Um, I'll make this into a disagreement with Michael Parenti as well. Um, if it's all true about the oil oligarchy and the uh, fantastic imperial and uh, feudal uh, design, which I don't think it is completely untrue to say, how is it that Saudi Arabia is so much opposed to regime change? Why should it be that the most depraved, the most medieval, uh, the most uh, corrupt, and the, the most swollen oligarchy in the region absolutely hates the removal of the Taliban, which was its client regime in Afghanistan, absolutely hates the removal of Saddam Hussein, who was its buffer regime in Mesopotamia. Why is it that some of the most sinuous members of this ruling class of ours, George Bush Sr., a pretty experienced guy in the old business, uh, and his acolytes, like Brent Scowcroft, have always been opposed to regime change in Iraq? One is more it because they think it's too risky? I wouldn't be surprised if that was the reason. And now we read every day that the Shia proletariat who do the heavy lifting in the oil fields of Saudi Arabia, the Saudis are so dumb that they've used a Shia underclass to actually work their oil fields. They're also making political demands against the filthy uh, Wahhabi clerics. Now, what I hope is that the United States is doing everything it can in Lebanon, in Egypt, and elsewhere to help these movements and to help them spread. But I've been in the Gulf recently and talked to a number of the people from the democracy movements in all of these countries, and I will simply tell you that with misgivings in some cases, um, but with enthusiasm in others, they all say whatever we think, whatever our prior opinion was, the moment when this democratic revolution began was the moment when the United States Marines destroyed the statue of Saddam Hussein in Fadu's Square in Baghdad in 2003. And that's Done. fact. And that's what I hope will happen in the next five years and also believe. I mean, for the record, I think we all are against the Wahhabi and these kinds of extremists and the terrible distortions that they commit and the terrible crimes they commit. Uh, against women, especially. I, I just, I just got a book. Can I plug it? Is that all right, for Chris? Okay. Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, I just got, I have a book coming out in the fall called *The Culture Struggle*, where, I, where I have at least two chapters that deal with some of these, these issues. Uh, Professor Crenshaw's. Uh, is that your name? Make sure we get it right. Okay, Professor Crenshaw. Uh, you know what it's going to be? Let's just talk a minute about what, where we are right now, in Iraq. Because of the invasion and occupation, unemployment is 70%. Villages and towns in many parts of cities are still without electricity, uh, except for a few hours in some cases. Water and sewage disposal, typhoid, typhus are a threat, a problem. Malnutrition, more than it's ever been. And this is a country that didn't have such, such problems before the 91 and the sanctions and such. There's been a nearly complete breakdown of the healthcare system. There's been large-scale environmental destruction with depleted uranium contamination, especially the Iraqi agricultural base, which, is, which had been one of the most fertile and, and prosperous in the Middle East. You see, some countries in the Middle East have oil but no water. Some have water and no oil. Iraq had both of them, um, and it's a it, its agricultural base has been pretty much destroyed. And there's been this, as I said, the privatization and deregulation of the entire economy. Um, ruthlessly suppressed, I don't know what, what Mr. Hitchens means when he can throw a term like that out. I'll tell you what ruthlessly suppressed meant in Fallujah. Dar Jamal, you know, who wrote in The New Generation, a 
his, his eyewitness account, and he speaks, uh, he speaks Arabic, his eyewitness account of what really went on in Fallujah, where Marines were shooting whole families who were getting up with white sheets and flags to surrender, and they were just getting gunned down. People who were fleeing and jumping into the water and rivers to sw swim away were getting shot in the water. One minute. The, mar the Marines went in there, and it was, it was a free fire zone. I don't care how ethical, how principled your secular humanistic standards may be, I don't think that can justify what happened in Fallujah. That's a major city, a decent city, not a bad place to live, and, and, and the people have been, people were exterminated. You know, the Marines got kicked out of Fallujah, they got beat. The report came in and said the Marines are evacuating Fallujah. I said, what are they talking about? Armies don't evacuate a city in war, they, they, they retreat. And they retreated. And then they went in for the final solution. It was Vietnam all over again, a free fire zone. And they just hit everything that was standing there. They came back in with a vengeance, and they killed uh, tens of thousands of people have been killed in Iraq. Tens of thousands of dead and wounded. And five years or 10 years from now, I think you're going to find that Iraq will not have recovered. Because what has been destroyed Time. in that country is not just its sewage system, but its future. Uh, this question is to Mr. Hitchens. Um, you said that uh, post uh, invading Iraq, uh, we found WMDs. Um, do you think there was a substantial amount that we found to pose a threat? And if so, why hasn't the administration made this public? Was the question audible to all? No, I thought not. Do you want to give it some Wellington boot this time, or should I repeat the question? I'll, I'll, re I'll if you'll trust me. Uh, the gentleman asks, um, in reference to what I said about the discovery of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq after the invasion, whether these were enough to constitute a threat, and whether or not they were, I think he implied, in any case, why doesn't the administration mention them? In other words, why are you hearing about this from me if it's true, is the subtext of the question. <laughs> um, but I hope that's a fair, I hope that's a fair praise, if we all, yeah. Well, it's, it, it is a good question, and I do know the answer to it. Um, the administration is, despite the uh, relative success of its presentation as a united front on message, uh, line of the day administration, uh, the most riven with internal hatreds and rivalries of any administration, I would say, since the Second World War. There is open hatred and contempt between the State Department and the CIA, the CIA and the State Department, state and CIA against DOD, defense. I've never heard in private anything like the sorts of things that they say. They're as traitors, not as wrong-headed. There's a real blood about this, and the, the main quarrel has been uh, over regime change in Iraq and the determination of the CIA to sabotage it. The, answer, the short answer to your question is this. If the administration said that Dr. Mehdi Obeidi's book should be read by everybody, and they should pay attention to the fact that Uday, Kusay, Uday and Kusay Hussein were able to bury nuclear centrifuges, the next day the CIA would say this had been exaggerated. And the resulting leak would make it uh, worse for the administration than if they'd said nothing at all. So that's why, uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, brothers and sisters, your republic is so messed up that the case has to be made by me. I have to volunteer to do what the Bush administration can't do for itself. How do you like that? I don't like it that much, but I'm willing to do it. Because I have an obligation to the truth, and it simply is not true to say that there was no WMD problem in Iraq. Flat out not true. And I can give any of you any time uh, documentary and evidentiary uh, proof of that. If I have another moment to spare, I can't believe my ears when I hear it said, Fallujah, great place to live if you could get. Fallujah was the headquarters of the Iraqi Taliban. It was the city that the Taliban Al-Qaeda forces had taken over and were running as a nightmare place for anybody to live, and as the headquarters of the extension of Al-Qaeda, Ba'athist uh, terror for the rest of the country. The crushing of the hold of those people on Fallujah was the necessary condition for those elections to be held. And if it was bloody, 
And if it was as bloody as Dr. Parenti says, you know, there were cameramen there at all times, and we even saw at one point a, a Marine a soldier make a bad call and shoot someone he wasn't sure had surrendered enough yet. I don't know that we could have been absolutely spared the chance of seeing this mass murder under white flags that we hear about. I'd be very, very surprised to hear it. But if it's true, it's because they didn't do Fallujah uh, six months before, which is when the US Marines wanted to do it. It's going to be because time. Because it was let to run, because it was allowed to get out of control. Now, you can have it one way, you can have it the other, but the alternative to the current status quo in Iraq is not a peaceful Iraqi democracy. It is the takeover of Iraq by Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces, which would mean not just the death of Iraq as a society and a country, but the deaths of countless Iraqis starting right then. And don't make no mistake about this. Uh, my friend, um, you can read about her this morning. It's a terrible story in the New York Times. It's going to be time. Well, just if I may, it's a moment of RIP. Marla Ruzhika. There's a lovely picture of her in the New York Times this morning. She was burned over 90% of her body the night before last uh, by a suicide bomber. She'd been spending her entire time in Iraq trying to calibrate civilian casualties, trying to get indemnity paid by the US Armed Forces to people who've lost their families in, in, um, in bad exchanges of fire and, uh, and bad uh, decisions made at roadblock. Uh, was the most sincere friend that the, um, the Iraqi civilian had in, in this, but it didn't save her from being murdered by some fascist as she drove from one appointment to another. They wouldn't have cared if they knew it had been her. They didn't care in any case. It didn't save her to be um, concerned in this way. Don't be naive about this. They would do that to you too. They mean to if they can. Um, I want to say something about this. Um, Mr. Hitchens keeps using the word we. We might have to face Nigeria. We might have to face this. We might have to face. I want to point out to you a rogue nation that we should really be facing, and that's the present United States administration. There's a rogue rule if you ever want to see one. They have unilaterally announced that they will not adhere to any international treaties, agreements of the past. They're not bound by any of these things. They have declared themselves above international law. They've dictated terms to others, and when the others do not immediately fall into line, they say they're being uncooperative. They've abandoned diplomacy, and they rule by ultimatum, is what they've been doing. They, are, they publish lists of nations and saying, this is our hit list. There's three axes of evil. No, there's 10. No, Dick Cheney said. There's 40 or 50, maybe 60. So that's why these countries are opposing us. Which of them is safe if they can be, where this super almighty God can get up there and say, um, we shall decide who lives and who shall die. Now, let me tell you about weapons of mass destruction. Let's go back to uh, uh, George Bush Sr. He was pursuing a war against Saddam Hussein. And if you think that he was so moved to pursue that war out of concern for Kuwaiti babies, I think you're being just a tad naive. And the trouble was that in the fall of 1990, the One US, minute, Dr. Prenti. Pardon me? One minute, I said. The U, the, in, in the fall of 1990, US public opinion was, 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 was <laughs> dipping around 30, 35, 40% to support military action. 87, 80, 90, despite the monopoly barrage that came and propaganda that came uh, from, uh, from the media, 80 to 90% of the American people were saying we would prefer a diplomatic solution rather than sending US military forces. Then in November 1990, a poll was published and it said, if it turns out that Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, the term weapons of mass destruction had not yet come in vogue. If he has nuclear weapons, would you support action against him? And then the percentage went up to 75%. After that, it was right after that, I swear I was watching and monitoring it very closely, that's all we suddenly heard, that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, that he could use them, that he was worse than Hitler, that he could blow us up, playing on our fear, again and again on our fear, so that these leaders can do what they want. And as far as Fallujah, and all that. I say we have not seen what's going on there. I had a, a friend Time. of mine. Yeah, you gave him four minutes. You're going to give me four also. <laughs> um, uh, an acquaintance, uh, Patricio Donizio, he's an Italian in Italy. He, his, he has a PhD in American studies. And he wrote me a long letter saying, you Americans are not seeing the war. 
We are seeing it. We can get certain channels. We see the carnage and the destruction of human life. I don't see any of that on your television. And we're not seeing it. And you know why we don't see it? Because if we saw it, American public opinion would swing around, just as it did in the bombing in Yugoslavia when they started bombing buses and killing people. And when those things get on the air, got on the air from Al Jazeera, why then, that's when Clinton lost 20 points in his support for that war. And that's when Al Jazeera got bombed by US planes. So they are controlling the information we get, and, uh, and they are not we, they are they. We are opposed to that. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this question is for Mr. Hitchens. Um, even if the uh, uh, the justifications, the independent. Wait, wait, can I can I get some clarification? I thought the agreement was that with every question, each of us would have a chance to make some response. I thought so too. So when you pose the question, the implication is only one person is going to respond, and, and then I feel like I'm crashing the gate to get my <laughs> word in. OK. I think we can read wow. This is addressed to both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, it, it, it is kind of addressed to Mr. Hitchens, but you, you can certainly respond. Um, of course, uh, independently, it's a, it, it seems like a very uh, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense that uh, we would want to take out a horrible, brutal dictator to Saddam Hussein, and uh, a, and that ideally we'd want to bring a, a better uh, state of affairs, a better kind of government to the Iraqi people. Um, this this seems uh, it seems to make sense uh, independently. But what what reason do we have to believe that the current administration? What reason do we have to trust that they? Uh, are genuinely seeking uh, democracy in Iraq. Uh, Dr. Prenti problematized the um, the idea that we went in there with with the uh, with the idea of holding elections and creating a democratic Iraq uh, from the beginning. And we we certainly didn't do those things in the past um, when we're uh, fighting the Soviet Union. Um, we we supported dictators. Uh, why would we change our uh, attitude now? We're facing a similar existential threat the way that you, that you portray it. Yeah, it's because I, th I would phrase it like this. It's, um, it's because we're at a point which some historians would call a conjuncture, and where there's an opportunity at any rate, which I've long urged it to seize, for the United States to get itself on the right side of history. I don't want to sound too Hegelian, but this has always been my argument for regime change in Iraq. Um, the need to alter the balance of power and forces in the region, which became a lot more evident to people, I think, after the events of September the 11th, um, was clear enough, I think, before. Um, it might be awful to have the oil resources of the region dominated by American monopolies, perhaps, but it's a good deal better than having Saddam Hussein threatening to set them on fire, as he did, in fact, do when he left Kuwait, and as he threatened to do with Saudi Arabia, to take down uh, the system and, and to uh, launch an ecologically catastrophic conflagration. Um, the keystone state in this region, this rotten arch of dictatorship and theocracy, was Iraq. If you take it out, you immediately alter the situation in the Wahhabi despotism of Saudi Arabia and the crumbling Shia theocracy of Iran. As it happens, you might be justified in doing that anyway if all you cared about was the oil, for example, or the natural gas, uh, or all you cared about was the military threat. But as it so happens, we're in a good position to know uh, that in Iraq, <laughs> in Saudi Arabia, and in Iran, and in Syria and neighboring countries, there are a vast number of people whose opinion has not been asked yet by their governments who are fed up, to say the very least. We knew that the large majority of Iraqis would greet this as an emancipation, as don't let anyone tell you different, they did. I saw it with my own eyes, and you can now see it with yours. Uh, the same will be true in Iran when that, when that goes, and as I've already said to you, the same is already true of the stirrings in Saudi Arabia, among particularly the Shia proletariat and Saudi women. So we are cutting with the grain in two senses. One is we're putting an end to a long period of despotism and stagnation, which had taken a threatening form, because uh, failed states become rogue states rather quickly, if they haven't become already. And rogue states always become 
failed states. I mean, what makes uh, Michael think that Iraq wasn't privatized already, I don't know. One minute. Thinking Iraq was the private property of the Saddam Hussein family. It was already privatized, and every citizen was the property of his state. But not only, in other words, are we uh, on the right side of history in that way, but we know that there are many people yearning for it to happen, and that thus we are releasing forces uh, that we don't know we can control. That's why I say there's something noble about the enterprise. That's why George Bush and Henry Kissinger and uh, George, uh, uh, General Scowcroft and the rest and Pat Buchanan are against it, because they fear the release of popular forces in this region. To take the chance that this will be positive, I think, is noble. And I hope I don't sound naive by saying so, but it's really naive to think that there's any future in the status quo. And if ever a status quo needed to be made war on, this was the one. So. Well, on the right side of history, um, I really think you should, you should take into account, besides uh, the things he's saying, uh, Chris was saying, I think you should also take into account the feelings of the Iraqi people. To be sure, given the kind of rule that Saddam Hussein, CIA, US supported rule for 20 years or more, there were many people who welcomed his overthrow. But there are also many of them will now testify, we welcome his overthrow but we want you out. We don't, we don't welcome what's happened. It's worse, it's horrible. Just look at the April 10 issue of the Washington Post. It was, a, it was a report on the April 9 massive demonstrations, some of the largest demonstrations uh, since 58 that went on, Shia demonstrations, right. But quote after quote, this is the Washington Post. This is the Washington Post. Quote after quote through the whole article, I've got the thing, and of course, it's sitting very securely in my hotel room. Um, I, I should have had it here. Um, quote after quote saying, we want you out. We don't want you here. Um, leave us alone. We'll settle our own affairs. I mean, those are paraphrases. Um, in fact, I do have the article right here. Let me just. No, no to the Americans, the crowd shouted. Yes, yes to Islam. Great. When will they be able to secure the country to bring us electricity, water, health services, and schools? Two years of occupation and things are worse. Uh, one banner reads, leave our land. We want to govern ourselves by ourselves. Another banner reads, force the occupiers out, occupiers out of our country. Yes for Islam, yes for Iraq. No to the occupation, no to terrorism. If you really want to oppose fundamentalism, if you really want to pursue noble causes, um, I think one of the things you might, we might do is, is listen to the people we're supposedly trying to save. God, God protects us sometimes from those who would come and save us. You know, That's it. I won't even use the rest of it. Would you accept a rebuttal to that? Of course. Well, this demonstration is organized by In fact, I'll give you one of my minutes there. Um, for one thing, I mean, I mean, I, it's my hometown newspaper. I'm not particularly impressed by the quotes in it, but they're all, they're all correct. And as you could tell, even as you read them out, these are the slogans of Moqtada Sada's organization. Mr. Sada's organization won, I think, two seats in the assembly. No, it's but Kistani. It, no, this is not just that. It was Mr. Moqtada Sada's demonstration. I, you, if you have the post, it'll say so. Perhaps you should have told them that. You can tell that from the slogans anyway. Mr. Sistani does not demand the withdrawal of the American forces from Iran. Mr. Sada, who does, has a small group of supporters in the parliament. Okay, you're absolutely right. It's El Sada. Well, Mr. Sada, I'm sorry to say, is also wanted for the murder of a very senior uh, Shia Imam, Imam al Khoi, sh shot down and knifed outside his place of worship in, in uh, Jaff. He's a, he's what has that got to do he's with 10,000 well, people? He's a, he's a thug. Tell me to get the, get the hell out of our country. I'm what sorry to, to say that, that his supporters may have a higher opinion of him than, um, say, I do. But perhaps, not as, perhaps your opinion of him is even higher than theirs. I can't vouch for that. One minute. What I can do is tell you this. The day after that demonstration, I met with Muwafaq al-Rubai, who is now was a political prisoner and a torture victim a couple of years ago, is now the National Security Advisor for Iraq. And he described to me the, the meetings that they'd had at his office. He said, we invited Muqtada Sada's members of parliament to my office. We invited the Iraqi police force. We invited some representatives of the coalition to make sure that Muqtada Sada's demonstration against our government and against the occupation would go off peacefully with thousands of people at it in the middle of Baghdad. He said this, he said, is one of the proudest moments of his life. 
Mr. Mokhtar Asada never said a word when Saddam Hussein was in power. He hadn't found his courage quite then. He's found his courage now, and he can have a demonstration, and he can vote, and he can publish a newspaper, just like everyone else in Iraq. But you couldn't do that under the previous regime, and you wouldn't be able to do it under his regime either. Time. Don't fool yourselves about these people, okay? Don't fool yourselves. Um, Mr. Hitchens laid out four conditions uh, whose violation would justify intervention. And I wonder, Dr. Parenti, whether you also have a set of principles whose violation would justify intervention by other countries. And secondly, uh, Mr. Hitchens, whether you believe that whenever a ruler violates those four conditions, intervention is justified, even mandated. And for both speakers, whether uh, to what degree you believe international agreement is necessary for intervention? Well, I, uh, the people who do these interventions do not represent the interests of the American people or of the people of the countries they intervene in. I mean, do you really think that Bush Sr. and Clinton after him went into Somalia because they suddenly were so seized by a concern for the welfare of the Somalian people when there, was, when there was famine going on in about eight or nine African countries. I mean, really serious famine. Um, do you really think that they're suddenly, suddenly so concerned about tyranny in country A or B when, in fact, they make alliances and give support to the likes of Pinochet and Fujimora and Marcos in the Philippines, Fujimora in Peru, Pinochet in Chile, people of, the, of, people of this caliber, murderers of all sorts, and then in bed with tyrants and dictators all along, and then suddenly saying, we are so, we're going to engage in a noble enterprise and bring freedom and pluralism to this country or that country, Iraq, which just happens to have a lot of oil and is troublesome in the Middle East. Um, the U.S. is busy building a global empire. You know, um, for decades, what's, what's happened is that terrorism is now being used as the way the new, the, it's a new world communist menace. We used to hear about the world communist menace, and now it's terrorism, and it's the jihad that's now being used. For decades, we heard that we had to maintain massive military bases all over the world because the Soviet Union was an implacable, uh, implacable uh, enemy, relentless, was coming upon us, and this is why we needed these huge military budgets, and this is why we needed hundreds of military bases all over. And there were some of us who said, no, that's not the reason that if the Soviet Union were to disappear, never thinking that it was going to disappear, but, but when, it, when it disappeared, the US would still have these military bases all over the world. Now, that position we took was untestable. We could not prove it. And yet, every so often, history allows you to run a test, a laboratory test. They actually remove a key ingredient and, and, hold, and, and, and hold it constant. The Soviet Union was overthrown, collapsed, however you want to describe it. And what happened to US policy? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. The US military budget climbed at a rate higher today, is climbing at a rate higher than during the Cold War. All those military bases have been kept. One or two were shut, and new ones have been opened in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, and in Central Asia. And we're talking about huge bases, huge ones. The one in Kosovo is, is, is huge. All the Cold War weapons were continued. One minute. And the US has pursued wars of intervention, wars of control, more violently and more frequently than ever. And a whole host of new enemies have been conjured up. In the, in the years since the, since the end of the Cold War, we have invaded Panama and Grenada and, 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 and uh, pursued proxy wars in, in a variety of other countries. And he invaded Iraq twice now and bombed Yugoslavia for 78 days around the clock uh, by that great, that great liberal Democrat, Bill Clinton. Um, there's no axis of evil. There's no communist country. There's no terrorist state that has a record of that kind of bloody interventionism. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the problem is right here. 
and we should look at what our rulers are doing to the people of the world and to ourselves. The empire feeds off the republic. 280 billion spent over there. Uh, the patricians expand the parameters of the empire, and meanwhile it gets bled. Athens, Athens is starved out so that Sparta can batten and become stronger and stronger. You see that every day in your newspapers. I go all over the country lecturing and every newspaper looks the same. City council considering cuts. Budget crises here. Um, county supervisors are, are out running out of money. Uh, huge debt in the state. All that, we, we, are, we are impoverishing ourselves as we pursue what, what, my, what my friend Christopher Hitchens thinks are noble causes. <clears throat> Well, perhaps you thought it was a boring question, but uh, you slightly um, excused yourself from asking yourself or answering the question about the, the four conditions. Um, you asked me, sir, to say whether I thought those four conditions all applied all the time. Um, and I think that they probably do not, in that, uh, for example, a, a country that was accused of harboring a terrorist group um, might respond quickly to United Nations sanctions or to a, a, a resolution of warning or, or admonition. Um, that there are a number of countries who uh, consider they have at least the right to develop some forms of nuclear energy um, and won't have this misinterpreted and consider it their, a matter of their autonomy. That's the case with the present negotiations with Iran, for example, and with also Pakistan, um, and so forth. But if a country more than once, in other words, repeatedly and systematically violates the, the Genocide Convention, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, international law governing the harboring of pirates and nihilists, and, uh, and repeatedly invades its neighbors, then I do think that yes, um, that sovereignty has been sacrificed and can only be restored by some form of intervention. Now you then said, well, by whom? Now the United Nations has to be it has to be said, it proved itself very weak in this way. I instanced the terrible failures in Rwanda, and I could, in, I could instance the current uh, crisis in Darfur. Now, as far as I know, I may be wrong about this, there isn't a huge Western material interest in the Darfur question. There's an interest in Sudan, but that's probably been why we've done so little about the Darfur question. Um, but we are certainly playing it multilaterally enough. I mean, anyone who wants to, to follow all the norms and procedures of exhaustive international law and resolutions must be very happy indeed with the way that we are handling the Darfur question. In other words, letting the Janjaweed militia finish the job of butchering the black African population of that province. This is nothing to be proud of. Um, there are, I think, local alliances. Oh, thank you. Actually, I convict myself of euphemism. I must be getting slightly tired. It's, of course, it's not nothing to be proud of. It's something to be very profoundly ashamed of. Um, now, there are local alliances that I, that I think uh, can play a role. The British Commonwealth, actually, was of some help in getting independence for Zimbabwe and for South Africa. And I'll mention another example, um, which will give me another opportunity to quarrel uh, with Michael. I'm sorry to say, I think it's disgraceful to refer to Slobodan Milosevic's rump Serbia, yoked only to Montenegro, which had bombed and invaded and tried to ethnically cleanse uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and made menacing noises about the partition of Macedonia. It's disgraceful for you to refer to that as Yugoslavia. Milosevic was the predator, the parasite, on the dead body of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was not bombed. The Milosevic regime was bombed, and it, my view was quite NATO was well within its rights to say, we cannot have the recrudescence of ethnic fascism on our borders. This is a responsibility we're entitled to shoulder. If Milosevic's principles are allowed, that people who have the wrong ethnicity can be moved by force or murdered if they're living on the wrong side of the frontier, then there'll be a war between Hungary and Romania next, over Transylvania. This could spread, it could destabilize and poison the whole region. We could be looking at a, another post-Versailles pre-fascist Europe. No, it wouldn't be responsible to see how that was going to come out. You have responsibility to stop it now. I think NATO did exactly the right thing, only it did it too late. There would have been much less cruelty and violence involved if it had been done more promptly. But don't get this wrong. The difference between Dr. Parenti and myself is not one of emphasis. As you've heard him say, he has some 
kind things to say about the Ancien Regime of the Ba'ath Party and the Serbian Socialist Party, and some struck me somewhat nostalgic things to say about the doomed regime of Brezhnevism in Eastern Europe. Um, this is a difference we would have had even when we were, if not in the same pew, at least in the same congregation. Mr. Hitchens, uh, given your four criteria for uh, intervention, and given that many countries fit this description, and given uh, this nation's scarce resources, both in terms of military manpower and um, uh, financial resources as well, uh, can't the argument be made that uh, we as a nation should go after countries that, are, that pose more of a danger in the future versus whose uh, past actions can be uh, more despised because it appears now that uh, Iran was more of the danger and that quite the contrary of being deterred, it seems that they're more enabled by the fact that we are uh, mired in Iraq. So what do you have to say about this uh, consequence? Um, you say that many countries meet all four of these conditions. Did I understand you correctly? Would you mind just specifying a couple to me? Well, Iran, for example. No. Iran has not violated the Genocide Convention, nor has it invaded any neighboring country. Okay, suppose... Those are two, I would say, quite large exceptions out of four. So, so aggression... So, oh, the question was. You mumbled also. Apologize. <laughs> Apologize more. <laughs> Speak up and don't and see if you can produce any other regime that violates all four of the conditions I mentioned. So are you, are you saying that we shouldn't intervene in... Well, make the question known to the audience first. And then I'll give you my answer. My question is that if, uh, if we're to follow these four criteria for aggression, we have limited resources to pursue all nations that should be pursued. Shouldn't we pursue the ones that... Uh, are more of a danger in the future to us as a nation. Well, I'm, I'm still, okay, that was all, that's audible to all. Okay, if, if, if it's intelligible to you, it isn't to me. I'm, I'm awfully sorry to say. I mean, I don't know what example you have in mind where these scarce resources might have been better employed. Iran has not invaded neighboring countries. It's been the victim of invasion. Actually, the Iranians have been on the same side as we have been against Saddam Hussein, against the Taliban, and against Milosevic. Um, they've not violated the Genocide Convention. Uh, it's pretty clear to me they've been cheating on the NPT, but that's only been found out because of the tremendous non-proliferation knock-on effects of the invasion of Iraq, which if you notice, as well as disarming Iraq itself and certifying it as disarmed, got Libya to capitulate and give hand over all its toxic and fissile stocks. They're all down to Lock and Key in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. From those stocks, it was possible to walk back the cap to the AQ Khan nuclear Walmart in Pakistan, and to find out the Iranians in the cheating that they've been doing, which is our main quarrel with them now. It's true that the Iranians sponsor international gangsterism, and I think should be made to pay for it. We know the names of the Iranian ministers who blew up the Jewish cultural center in Buenos Aires, who uh, sent death squads to Berlin to kill Kurds meeting in the Mykonos restaurant, who tried to kill Salman Rushdie, for writing a novel, and many other things. I think that shouldn't be without cost, but you can't really invade a country just for that. We know furthermore that Iran is a potential democracy, that it has elections where the people vote for their candidates who just aren't allowed to take office or power. This is not quite the same as the totalitarian nightmare um, of Iran. So I'm sorry, I, I can't see the force of your question, and even if there were some more and better examples, it doesn't seem to me that there would be any case for exempting Saddam Hussein from the judgment that must fall on a government that is a serial violator on these four crucial questions. I don't set up criterion and decide which countries we could in, intervene and invade and which countries we shouldn't and how we should do it. Of course, what I've argued, my burden of my argument tonight has been that we have that the U.S. First of all, we aren't operative. It isn't we. It's these US rulers, and they don't represent our interests no more than they represent the interests of these countries. They are not motivated by 
uh, Mr. Hitchens' four criteria. They're motivated by interests that have been longstanding. They have invaded about 80. They have intervened in about 80 or 90 different countries around the world. In Africa alone, about 50 countries, there's only 53 on the whole continent, 50 countries have received U.S. military aid. The U.S. has supported about 11 major wars in Africa over the last 30 years and consistently doing that. About 7 million people have died in Africa. It's one of the most war-torn continents in the world because of U.S. interventions. And to sit there with a presumption and say, well, who should we invade? Who should we invade? Who should we not? Uh, well, this, well, well, no, Iran, ha Iran maybe qualifies for one of those criteria, but not the other three, or, or maybe none of them at all. Oh, uh, and to do that kind of game is to overlook, really, the huge picture and the terrible crimes that have been perpetrated. And the more war-ravaged Africa is, and Africa is a very valuable country, we get, we get about 70% of all major minerals from Africa, from cobalt to chromium to manganese to any bunch of uh, all sorts of other things, gold. To, 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 uh, to, to not see that the more, the more war-ravaged these, these countries become, the more torn apart they are by US interventions uh, in part. It's not the only, I'm not saying that's the only factor. The poorer they are and the more willing and ready they are to sell their resources and their labor at, at, uh, at pitiful prices. And that's the goal. The goal is to keep the world poor. The more hungry, the more impoverished you are, the harder you will work for less and less. And that's the goal of this administration, the reactionaries in this administration today. The reactionaries, they're not conservatives. A conservative is somebody who resists any kind of egalitarian changes because he wants to maintain his particular privileges. These people aren't, they aren't resisting change. They are vigorously pursuing changes. They are reactionaries. Their goal is to get us back to 1900. Why do you think that Americans don't work for 17 cents an hour the way people do in Haiti or Indonesia? Is it because we're so much more self-respecting? No, it's because we have reached a stage of historical struggle where we don't have to do that. And the goal is to get us back. In 1900, the United States was a third world country, half a century before the term had been invented. We had typhoid epidemics in the eastern cities. We had mass underemployment. We had hardly any public education to speak of. There were almost no human services. The human services consisted of a, a soup kitchen in the back of some church, maybe, a uh, Salvation Army or something like that. Um, and people did work for, for subsistence wages. And that's where they'd like to get us back, not just the Africans, not just the Middle East, not just any place else. The goal is a class victory. The goal is to get you working harder and harder for less and less, which means more for them. To get rid of these bad habits of you thinking you have a right to a paid vacation, to job security, to health care, to environmental protection, all that stuff. All the money spent on those stupid things is one less dollar that goes into my pocket. And so the goal is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500. Not just economic plunder and money as such, but it's a whole class society and system. And one minute. One. You could have a minute, I've finished. Thank you. <laughs>